Amen. Well, I would like to um, take this time to uh, greet and welcome Chris and Amanda Michelson. Chris is um, somebody I got to know, what, a year and a half ago or something like that, through, of all people, Mark Stewart. <laughs> so thank you, Mark, for connecting. Uh, was it on Facebook, maybe? Maybe, huh? Um, just a possibility of that. No, Chris has uh, got a heart for God, and he's, um, he's got a powerful testimony of how the Lord has transformed his life, and he's got the, a calling on his life to share the good news of Jesus Christ and the power to change. So let's give him a warm Plasky welcome. Uh. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, it's so good to be back in Pulaski, I'll tell you. Uh, we love Pulaski. We love new life. And I almost love Wisconsin, being from Minnesota, you know? <laughs> almost. But I'll never love the Green Bay Packers, okay? Just saying. <laughs> but I love all of you guys very much. And, uh, no, it's so good to be here. And i got to have a little fun with the, the Packers and the Vikings, right? But um, no, it's so good, so good to be here. Um, it's it feels like home, you know. I said it last night. I'll say it again. You know, it's when you come the first time, you're you're a guest. But when you come back the second time, you feel like you're part of the family. You know, so uh, it's good to be back here and with all of you. Um, as Pastor Bob said, I have my beautiful wife Amanda here with me this morning, and so um, she'll be with me. She'll actually be at the table. Uh, on your way out, we've got some some product there for sale, and all the proceeds go to our gospel crusades. So we've got some T-shirts that say Jesus saves, some wristbands uh, there as well. The T-shirts are twenty, um, the wristbands are five, and literally all the proceeds are going to seeing souls saved. So I think with every wristband, we can see like potentially six or seven people come to Christ. Um, so. Anyway, just make yourself available of that. All, almost all of the black T-shirts are gone, so make sure you get back there and pick one up. So um, anyway, so got Amanda with me, and it's always good to have her here. Uh, Pastor Bob, I just want to say thank you for having me again. It's truly an honor to be here. Uh, we love you and Miss Trudy and the whole family here at New Life. So thank you guys, and thanks, Mark, for connecting all of us. So it's good. Amen. Come on, let's give them a hand. And can we give the hand a hand to the worship team? Aren't they amazing? Come on. Praise God. Thank you, guys. Man, it's, uh, it's great to be in a place where the presence of God is just thick and rich uh, during worship, and so I appreciate them very much. Um, also, on our table on your way out, we have a newsletter sign up if you're interested in receiving updates and pictures from our crusades that we do. Uh, we go into really dark nations and do gospel crusades um, in places that are extremely unreached. And so we have a newsletter uh, list there if you're interested in signing up for that. And if you're an intercessor, we have an intercessor's email. You can just sign up for that. We, you won't get any other emails or anything except prayer requests. And um, so if you have a heart to intercede and to pray, uh, you can also sign up there. There's On the form, there's a box you can check just for to be an intercessor and just to get those prayer updates. Um, we go into places that are very dangerous. Uh, my, my heart is to go into places where people have never heard about Jesus before and to preach the gospel to, to those that are unreached, places where people don't like to go. In fact, um, uh, in April, we were in uh, Pakistan for our most recent gospel crusade there in Pakistan where we had over 43,200 people make first-time decisions for Jesus in Pakistan. Amen. You can see some of the pictures. There's people standing up on the buildings because there wasn't room on the field. And uh, anyway, God just moved in tremendous ways in Pakistan. It's 0.7% it's, uh, Christianity in Pakistan. Uh, but the Pakistani people are hungry for the gospel. They're tired of 
the, the radical teaching that, that they've heard in that country from other religious figures. And when they hear the gospel message of Jesus and how Jesus loves them and died for them, they're literally coming to Christ by the tens of thousands. And so it's just been incredible to be able to go there and to be able to minister to them. We're seeing God do incredible miracles um, in, in these gospel crusades. And so um, it's just awesome what God is doing. So uh, I want to thank New Life. Thank you guys for supporting us and helping us to go to, this, to these countries. Um, God is moving, and uh, it's, just, it's just been amazing. So um, anyway, it's kind of a little bit about our ministry. We go about five times a year. Um, to that part of the world. There's some other countries that we go to as well that I really can't talk about um, on live recording, but uh, God is moving in the world in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you know, we, we live in a day where the media tries to, to make us think that the world is just going to hell. And, and there's no hope for the world. Let me tell you, there's hope for the world. His name is Jesus. And he is moving, he is alive, amen. He's just as alive today as he was 2,000 years ago when he walked here on earth with his disciples. And he is moving in these parts of the world. He's showing his glory, his power. He's showing his love to humanity. And, And you might not see anything like this on the news, but I'll tell you, in the Middle East and in Asia, God is moving and people are coming to Christ by the millions all over um, South Asia and in the Middle East. And so that's uh, just our honor to be able to go and to, to preach the gospel in the nations of the, of the earth. Amen? Amen. Um, also, one last announcement, one last commercial. I'm on Facebook. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You better not be on Facebook while I'm preaching, but... But you can go on there and find me, Evangelist Chris Michelson. Michelson spelled with two Ks. Looks like Mickelson, but my ancestors are Norwegian, so we say Michelson. But, um, but yeah, you can go on there and follow us there. We post updates and pictures and all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's the last commercial. Amen? Well, I wanted to start this message out. I like to laugh. Is that all right? You guys like to laugh? You know, the Bible says that medicine, uh, that that laughter is medicine for the soul, amen? And so I've got kind of a funny little letter that I just love to share. Uh, it's It's a letter from a kid who joined the Marine Corps way back in the day, and it's their rendition of of kind of what life is like in boot camp, and it's from Camp Pendleton in um, Southern California, in uh, Oceanside, California. And so this is just their letter home to, um, to Ma and Pa. It says, Dear Ma and Pa, I'm going to, and you've got to forgive me, I'm from Minnesota, but I'm going to try to give my best southern accent, all right? The letter says, Dear Ma and Pa, I'm doing good, hope y'all are too. Tell them brothers of mine, Walt and Elmer, that joining the Marine Corps sure beats working for old man Dixon by a mile. Tell them to join up real quick before all the spots here are filled up. I was restless when I first got here because you got to stay in bed till nearly 6 a.m., but I'm getting used to sleeping in. (laughs) Tell Walton Elmer all you got to do before breakfast is smooth your cotton and shine some things. No hogs to slop, no cows to milk, no wood to split, and no hay to bale. Practically nothing at all. Tell them you got to shave, though, but it ain't so bad since they got water and all, and it even comes out of a hydrant. (laughs) Breakfast is strong on trimmings like fruit juice, cereal, and this stuff they call yogurt. I ain't had none of it yet just for the sound of it, yogurt. The menu's kind of weak on pork chops, fried okra, black-eyed peas and grits and fried taters. And they never sell, uh, serve any of the good stuff like squirrel, rabbit, or possum. But tell Walt and Elmer you can always sit by two city boys who live on nothing but coffee. Their food plus your food will hold you over, hold you over till noon again when you get fed again. It's no wonder them city boys can't walk much. We go on these route marches, which the sergeant says are long walks to harden us. 
Well, if he thinks so, I'm not going to tell him any different. A route march is about as far as our house is to the mailbox. <laughs> then them city boys get sore feet and we have to ride back in the trucks. This next part will wreck Walter and Elmer with laughter. I keep getting medals for shooting. I don't know why. The bullseye is near as big as, as, big as a chipmunk head. And it don't even move none at all. And it ain't even shooting back at you like them Hicket boys back home. All you got to do is lay there real comfortable like and hit it. You don't even have to build your own shells. They come in boxes for you. <laughs> then we have what's called hand-to-hand -hand combat training. You got to wrestle with them old city boys. I got to be real careful, though, because they break real easy. <laughs> it ain't like fighting that old bull back home on the farm or nothing. Really, I'm about as the best they got at this hand-to-hand -hand combat training, except for that old Tug Jordan from Frog Lake, Tennessee. He and I joined up about the same time, and uh, I only beat him once. But I'm 5'6", six, I'm 135 pounds. He's 6'8", 300 pounds. Be sure to tell Walt and Elmer to hurry up and join before other fellers catch wind of this cushy setup they got here and come in like a stampede. <laughs> Well, that's about all I got to say. Now tell them boys not to fiddle around and get here quick. Signed, your loving daughter, Gail. <laughs> that ain't right. I want to tell you today, as children of God, you're stronger than you think you are. You're better than your, 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 bigger than your biggest obstacles. You're better equipped than the best equipped army. You're wiser than every, the wisest scheme of the devil, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Amen? Amen. If the devil tries to tell you you throw like a girl, you just remind him of old Gail. Amen? God's got a plan for you, and this morning I want to talk about faith. You know, I think Gail had some faith. Amen? And I think we need to have faith. You know, we live in a day and a time where, where our faith is, is at a, is being pressed on by every side. Our faith, you know, you turn on the news. I live in Orlando, okay, and so we flew here knowing we were coming, and, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, living in Orlando right now with this hurricane coming, people are under so much fear. You turn the news on, all you hear is fear, fear, fear. Why does fear, why is fear on the news? Because it sells. That's why. But all we hear all day is fear, and then we've, got, we've got fear pressing in on every single side. And I believe today, my friends, we need faith to move mountains. Amen? And, and so I want to give just some key principles this morning on having great faith, having faith that will overcome our obstacles, having faith that will overcome fear and anxiety and worry and pain and, and, and whatever circumstances might come our way because I believe we are in a time where we, are, we need desperate faith. We need strong faith. Somebody say amen. So I want us to turn to Matthew chapter number 14. Matthew 14. This is the story of the disciples being out in the water. They are in their boat. And uh, there's a terrible storm that comes up. And they see Jesus walking on the water. Matthew chapter 14. If you're there, say amen. Uh, Matthew 14, I'm going to start in verse number 25. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, the disciples, and he was walking on the sea, walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Say, he walked on the water. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, 
he became afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out and he said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased and those that were in the boat came and they worshipped Jesus. Somebody say they worshipped Jesus. Don't let anyone tell you you can't worship Jesus. And they said, truly you are the son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning your word would be, your word would be lifted high, God, that we would know your word, we'd understand your word. God, that we would know you through your scriptures. So, Lord, I pray that this morning you'd have your way, that you'd touch us, you'd give us great faith to overcome every obstacle in our lives, and we pray that you would be exalted above all this morning. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. When I think about great faith, I always think about Peter walking on the water. I mean, what kind of faith would you have to have to step out of a perfectly good boat in the middle of a storm in the middle of a lake? Now, these guys were fishermen. They were, Peter was a fisherman. He'd been fishing his whole life. So this was not just any old stormy weather. This was a bad storm. They were afraid. This was a really bad situation. And there Peter was, and he saw this figure walking on the water. The Bible tells us that the disciples became afraid. And when they spoke out, uh, Jesus spoke out to them and said, Don't be afraid. It's I. It's the Lord. And when I think about Peter... There's five things that I see in this story that Peter does that are key principles for us to have great faith today. So I just want to share these five principles that I see here in this story. Number one, look with me here in verse number 28. It says, Peter answered when he saw him, and he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. The first principle of having great faith is that faith starts with Jesus and faith ends with Jesus. All faith, it, it starts with Jesus. If we don't have Jesus, we're not on a firm foundation. Faith starts with Jesus and faith ends with Jesus. Peter saw Jesus. He said, Lord, if that's you, then I know I can come out to you on the water. I can do anything with Jesus. If, if I've got Jesus, I can do anything. I can co overcome any obstacle. So Peter knew this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. That word evidence can also be referred to as conviction. When you look at it in the Greek, it has to do with evidence in a courtroom or conviction in a court case, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. You know, Peter knew that if that was Jesus, he was convinced. He had such conviction in his heart that he knew he could overcome any obstacle because with Jesus, we can do all things through him and with him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You see, friends, Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. He is the one that created faith in the first place. John chapter 1 tells us that, that in the beginning, God created the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not, he didn't create the Word. It says, in the beginning was the Word. He was and, and we know that that word became flesh and dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus. He created everything. Everything was created by Jesus, and everything was created for Jesus. And so he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. So if we can put our faith in Jesus, we will be able to overcome anything, any storm you're going through, any obstacle that you might be. You know, these disciples were in a storm. They were in a battle. Their faith was waning. Fear was overwhelming them. And in that moment, Peter knew, Lord, if that's you, call to me out to the water. I know I can come to you. And Peter walked and stepped out of the boat, 
and a miracle took place. He put his foot on the water and began walking to Jesus. My friends, you might be in the middle of a storm right now in your own life. Maybe there's circumstances around you that seem shaky, unwavering, things that are, that are happening right now in your family or in your work situation. Or, or maybe you've got family living in Florida, you know, and, and, and there's, there's this, this fear that's coming around you. There's a storm that's happening. My friends, I want to tell you today, you can trust Jesus. You can trust him. He's there. He's with you in the midst of the storm. You can be like Peter and call out to Jesus and he will answer. Amen? Point number two, if we're going to have great faith, look here in verse number 29. It said, so he, Jesus, told Peter one word, come. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out to you on the water. Verse 29, so Jesus said, come. And Peter walked to him. He went out, came out of the boat, and he walked on the water. I could see the image right there of Peter standing on the side of that wooden boat. And the storm is raging, and he sees Jesus out there on the water. And and Peter says, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus says one word, come. And Peter took that big size 13 and stepped over the boat, put his foot down on the water. But you know, God showed me something about this. I don't think Peter was actually walking on the water. No, I know it says here in the Bible that he walked on the water. But you know, I don't think he could walk on the water because Peter being a fisherman, he knows. You can't walk on water. It's impossible to walk on water. So what was Peter walking on? He was walking on one word, come. Because Peter knew that I can walk on the word. I can stand on the word of God. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Peter knew if Jesus said come, If he said, come, I can stand on that water. I can stand on the word of God. Jesus is the son of God, made flesh. He is the ancient of days, the word of God, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And if Jesus said, come, I can stand on that word. I can trust God's word, and I can walk to him out on the water. You see, my friends, we can trust the word of God. We can trust his word. The word of God is a firm foundation. The Bible tells us in Matthew 24, 35, that heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus says, my words will never pass away. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, he closed, the mount with, with, he closed that sermon with a story about a man who built his house on the sand and another man who built his house on the rock. The rock meaning the word, the rock meaning Jesus himself. And the man that built his house on the sand didn't have a firm foundation. And when the storm came, the house sank into the water. But the man who built his his house on the firm foundation, on the rock, that man, that house was able to withstand the storm. My friends, as you're going through storms in life, as you're going through challenges and difficulties, my friends, you can stand on the word of God. It is a firm foundation. It is the rock of ages, Jesus Christ himself. I remember a, a great miracle, uh, a guy that produced, didn't produce, but a guy that moved in great signs and wonders, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. How many of you know that guy's name? Amen. I love Smith Wigglesworth. He, he was a crazy old evangelist back in the, the uh, turn of the 1900s, and he saw incredible miracles. Uh, in fact, it's documented that he saw more than, he saw 29 people documented raised from the dead. 29 people in his ministry. He was a man of incredible faith. But he said something that is so powerful. He said, I'm not moved by what I see or how I feel. I'm only moved by one thing, the word of God. 
You see, my friends, we can be moved by what we see. We can be moved by what our circumstances say. You might, have been, you might be praying for your sickness to go away for years. Maybe you've got pain in your body, and you've been praying and praying and praying for years, and you're like, why, why is this going on? What's happening? And my friends, don't put your faith in what you see or your lack of experience, but put your faith in the Word of God. Because it is a firm foundation. I remember going to Pakistan for the very first time. You know, going to Pakistan is not a place most people like to go to, okay? And uh, I, I personally love that country. I love Pakistan. I love the people there. But it is very hostile and dangerous to go there. And I will never forget the first time I went, I was a guest uh, to somebody else's crusade. I was going there to uh, just see what was happening. It was kind of a scouting trip for me. And I was doing some ministry in the churches, and then the first night of the gospel, gospel meeting, we went to this festival, and there were thousands of people there. And I'll never forget going up there. We, we couldn't drive up to the stage, so we drove up to the backside of the crowd, and there was this crowd of people, thousands of people, and the stage on the other side of the crowd. And so we had to walk down the center aisle through all of these people and the, to get to the stage. And behind the stage was a building, kind of like the ones you saw in the picture in a different, different city. And behind the stage, there was this building, and there was a guy walking up on the building. Now, uh, the coordinator had hired security guards for this crusade, just like we do. We have over 60 guys with machine guns who surround the entire perimeter to make sure everyone is safe coming in. Everyone has to come in through one main entrance where we have metal detectors to make sure no one's carrying bombs or guns, and, uh, which is kind of normal in, in that country. And so, but I, I'm, I'm nervous, you know. And the security company that was hired, you know, in Pakistan, they don't have Christian security companies, okay? Hello. These people are not probably believers, Okay. But we've hired, they've hired this security company, and they don't have, like, security on their shirt. You know, they're just, like, plain Jane clothes, whatever they're wearing. And so we're walking up this aisle in the midst of thousands of people, and there's that building with a guy standing on the building with a turban on his head, and he's got a gun up in the air, and he's dancing. And I'm walking toward him. And I said, oh, God, I hope that's a security officer. And I hope he's on our side. Amen. And so we're walking up and fear gripped my heart. And I remember thinking, oh, Lord, this might be it. This might be the end. I mean, like, this might be how I go down in the books, you know. And my friend is walking with me and he leans over and he's like, bro, do you see that up there? And I said, yeah, dude. And he goes, this might be it. I said, yeah, <laughs> this might be it. And fear almost paralyzed me in that moment. It was so strong. I thought, man, I might die here today. And fear started to just overwhelm me. And in that moment, I began to remember what the word said. I began to remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that no weapon formed against me will prosper. The Bible says I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. It says that I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. Hebrews says, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I started to remember what Psalm 91 says. It says that I will dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers, and under his wings I will take refuge. He is the, he is truth. Uh, his truth shall be my shield and my buckler. I will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. My friends, I started to put my faith in what the word says and not in my circumstance because when you put your faith in the word, there's power, there's comfort, there's peace, there's security because the word of God will last forever. 
It is a firm foundation that we can have. My friends, maybe you're going through a situation right now. You need to get in the Word. Spend time in the Word every day. I remember when I got saved uh, almost 12 years ago, my wife and I got saved out of drugs and alcohol. I was a drug dealer in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. My life was a mess. When I got saved, I got in the Word, and the Word started to build my spirit because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. My faith began to rise. I was reading seven, eight, ten chapters every day. I couldn't get enough of the Word. It became alive to me. I want to encourage you, friends, if you're not in the Word, get in the Word every day. If you don't know where to start, start in John. It's an amazing book of John, the disciple of Jesus, who had this great revelation of God's love for him and for all of humanity. Get in the Word and begin reading the Word, and as you read it, your faith will begin to build and rise. Read over Psalm 91. It's such a, an amazing chapter. Actually, what I, what I read to you was I put myself into Psalm 91, and I began to declare Psalm 91 over me. And you can do the same. Declare the word of God over your life and your circumstances. Amen? Amen. Quickly moving on. Point number three, if you want to have great faith, look with me here in verse 30 and 31. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Number three, if we're going to have great faith, we've got to realize that fear causes doubt, but faith rises above. Fear causes doubt, but faith rises above. Peter got his eyes off of Jesus. Here he was in the midst of a storm, literally walking on water. Nobody had ever done that before him and Jesus. And he's walking on water, doing something just absolutely miraculous, but he got his eyes off of Jesus, and he started looking at the waves and the situation around him, and the Bible said he started to sink. You see, when we get our eyes off of Jesus and we start to focus on our surroundings and focus on the issues of life that surround us and we get our eyes off of Jesus, doubt comes into our heart and fear comes into our heart and we begin to sink. But there's Jesus always standing there and Peter cries out and says, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabbed him. But this morning, I wanna tell you that fear is something that we all deal with. And fear is something that the devil wants to control you with. He wants to use fear to influence you, to make you think certain things, to get you off of what God's word says about you. We were recently getting shots to go to a country in, in, in Africa, to go to Nigeria. And the travel shot doctor <clears throat> said to us that more than half of her patients that come into the travel shot doctor to get these shots, she said more than half of the, her patients are on anti-anxiety medication. Anti, half of her patients. That means half of Americans are on medication for fear. You see, friends, fear is an issue and it's something we have all have to deal with. But my friends, we don't have to deal with fear, with medicines. We can use Jesus through Jesus, there's faith, there's hope, there's security. And we can find faith in Jesus. I love what Reinhard Bonnke said about faith. He said, if, if doubt are like flies, if doubts are like flies, then faith is a fly swatter. Amen? We got to have faith to, to overcome doubt. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. See, my friends, when you know the word, you can put the word to use. And when you have that fear that comes over, you can say, you know what, devil? I'm not going to live by fear. I'm going to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'm going to stand on the word. And the word tells me that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? Amen. Quickly moving on, number four, if we're going to have great faith, we must realize that faith is spelled T-R-U-S-T, trust. Faith is spelled trust. 
T-R-U-S-T. If we're going to have great faith, we need to trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, uh, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Peter, Peter uh, knew it was impossible to walk on water, but he trusted Jesus. If we're going to have great faith, we have to trust in the Lord. Another way of spelling faith is R-I-S-K, risk. You see, if we're going to have great faith, we've got to be willing to trust that when we step out in faith, God is going to be there for us. He's going to help us get through, and we've got to take a risk to step out. Could you imagine if Peter would have stepped out of that boat and splashed into the water? That would have been a very funny scene, I think. I think all of the disciples would have been laughing about that for a long time. They would have said, oh, Peter, you're such a, you're such a crazy guy. You stepped out of the boat. You thought you could walk on water. Peter took a risk in stepping out of the boat and believing the word of God. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. We've got to have great faith. I remember a story about a, a tightrope tight rope walker. Uh, there's a story that he was trying to cross the Niagara Falls. And he was stretched a rope from one side to the other, and he made a big advertisement, and drew a big crowd, and, and he walked out there on the tightrope, and he, before he walked on the tightrope, he said to the people, he said, how many of you think I can walk across the Niagara Falls? Nobody said anything. He got out there, and he started walking. He got out over the Niagara Falls and walked back to the people, and they were all cheering and clapping, and and he said, well, how many of you think that I can take a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls and come back? And they were clapping and cheering. They said, yeah, you can do it. So he grabbed a wheelbarrow and he went out the tightrope and came back to the people. And they were all cheering and applauding. He said, now, how many of you believe I can put a person in the, in the wheelbarrow and take it <laughs> out across the Niagara Falls, and they were cheering, yeah, yeah, you can do it, you can do it, no problem. And he said, do I have any volunteers? And the crowd went silent. You see, friends, faith is getting into the wheelbarrow. Faith is getting into God's wheelbarrow, amen? Not a tightrope walker's but it's getting into God's wheelbarrow and realizing that when we're in God's wheelbarrow, we can trust him. He's gonna protect us. He's gonna watch over us. And no matter what the circumstances around us look like, we can trust Jesus. Amen. Faith is getting into the wheelbarrow and trusting God. I'm gonna close with this. Uh, we can have the worship team come back up. Point number five, if we're gonna have great faith, we need to realize that faith doesn't start when the miracle happens, but faith starts the moment we first believe. If you're gonna have great faith, you don't have faith after the miracle happens. It starts before you ever even step out of the boat. Faith starts the moment you believe and you say, you know what, Jesus, I believe. I believe you can trust me. I, I, I believe you can, you can protect me. I believe that you can move in my life no matter what the situation is. Remember the story of uh, the Revolutionary War. You know, we just celebrated that not too long ago, back in July. You know, how many of you remember the story of that? Obviously, nobody here is old enough to have been there, but the story of the Revolutionary War, a.k.a. the War of Independence. Now, if you, I'm going to ask you a question. I just want you to shout out the answer, if you know it. What day or date did the revolutionary, the War of Independence, conclude on? Just shout it out. Anyone, any takers? July 4th, 1776. That was actually a trick question. Because July 4th, 1776 is the date we all remember this war by. But that was not the, the date that the war concluded. The date that the war concluded was seven years later on September 3rd, 1783. 
So why don't we celebrate September 3rd, 1783? Why do we remember July 4th, seven years prior? Because on July 4th, 1776, that was the date that our forefathers said, you know what? We're going to war. We're signing the bill. We're signing that declaration of independence. And we believe we're going to overcome Great Britain. You see, faith doesn't come the moment that you win the war. Faith starts the moment you first believe. When you say, you know what, devil? I don't care what the circumstances are. I'm trusting God. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to live for him the rest of my life. I'm going to go on that mission trip. I'm going to do whatever it is that he's called me to do. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust him. Faith starts the moment we first believe. I want us to all stand just in the presence of the Lord. My friends, maybe you're at a crossroad in your life where you know all about Jesus. You know all about God, but you never truly put your life into his hands. You've never really gotten in the wheelbarrow. You've never truly committed your life to him and said, you know what? I'm going to live for Jesus the rest of my life. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. I want Jesus. I want God, and that's it. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're in this place, and you made that decision a long time ago to follow Jesus, but you've gone astray. You've gone You've backslidden. Well, this morning, my friends, it's time to slide back to Jesus. Come back to Jesus. He loves you. The Bible says that God died for you, that God sent his son Jesus to literally hang bloody on a cross because he loves you. He hung there and died for your sins. And this morning, all he asks is get into my wheelbarrow. I'll save you. I went to the cross for you is what he would say to you this morning. I died in your place. You were supposed to be separated from me for eternity. But I went to the cross. I died for you. It's a story of a a young man who was battling with faith. And he was actually an atheist. He had a Christian friend who had been talking to him for a long time about what it meant to follow Jesus and they, they battled the scriptures and all of these things. And this atheist really wanted to come to Jesus but he was just afraid of making that step, making that commitment to really turn his life over to the Lord. One night he went to bed and had a dream. And there in the dream he sat on a fence in the middle of a giant grassy field. He sat there on the middle of this white picket fence going down the middle of this field. He wasn't on one side or the other. He looked to his right, and on the right side of the fence was heaven, and it was God and Jesus and all of God's holy angels on the right side of the fence. He looked on the left side of the fence and he saw the devil and all of his demons and and there was hell on the left side. And there he sat right in the middle on top of the fence. And the devil all of a sudden appeared right before this man. He said, son, you've got to make a decision. You've got got to either go to the left or to the right. Are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? The young man said, no way. I'm staying right here on the fence. I'm not going to go one way or the other. I'm comfortable right here on the fence. The devil looked at this man in the dream. He said, son, don't you realize I own the fence? The fence is mine. Your lack of making a decision is making a decision in itself. All of a sudden, the man woke up from the dream. He dropped down to his knees on the side of his bed, and he said, Oh, Jesus, I decide right now to follow you. He gave his life to the Lord. His life changed forever. My friends, I believe this morning, there's some of you here that are like that man. You're on the fence. You've never made that decision, or maybe you did a long time ago, and you went back and sat on the fence. 
My friends, it's time to come to Jesus. It's time to give him your life, to surrender all and to follow Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every person here. Lord, I pray that you would give them great faith, that they would have faith that moves mountains, that they'd put your faith, their faith in your word, and they'd overcome every obstacle that's come against them. And Lord, I pray that today if there's anyone here who's never received Jesus, they're sitting on that fence. Lord, I pray that today they would get off the fence, they'd come home, they'd come into the loving arms of their Savior. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who has backslidden, like the prodigal son, God, I pray that today they'd turn from their sins and they'd come home, they'd come to Jesus. My friends, if there's anyone here this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, you've never made that decision. You know you're sitting on the fence. You want to make that decision to come to Jesus. I'd like to pray for you. So on the count of three, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Say, that's me, Chris. I need Jesus. I need salvation this morning. I need him to forgive me of my sins. On the count of three, lift your hands. One, two, three, all over the room. All over the room. Hallelujah. Yeah, just lift your hand if that's you. Amen, amen, amen. Hands going up all over. If there's anyone else, maybe you're a backslider. My friends, this morning, slide back to Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's do this. I'd like to pray for those of you who left, lifted your hand. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you to receive salvation. Just come here to the front. Please come now. There's many, many people. Please come. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. Come on. Anyone else? Hey, buddy. There's many other people. Please keep coming. If you raise your hand, you want salvation this morning, I'd like to pray for you. You got to get out of the boat. It's time. Come. Please keep coming. There's many others. It's time. It's time to get off the fence, guys. It's time to come to Jesus. God bless you. Hey, God bless you, buddy. Keep coming. Hallelujah. Isn't this good? It's so good. Hey, God bless you, brother. Yeah. Anyone else? Come on. I know there was more, pe more hands. Jesus loves you so much. He died just for you. So we're just going to pray. Yeah, amen. Keep coming. Hallelujah. Isn't this good? God is so good. My friends, 11 years ago, I made this decision. It's the best decision I ever made. God changed my life forever. He loves you so much. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. Well, here's what we're going to do. The Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. If we just call on his name and say, Jesus, I believe in who you are, and I, I accept that your sacrifice on the cross, the Bible tells us we will be saved. It's a promise. We can know forever we will go to heaven from this day forward. So we're just going to pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You can just repeat after me. The important thing is to, to mean these words with the bottom of your heart. And I want all of us to pray this prayer together in support of these here in the front. So let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today a sinner in need of salvation. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, I promise to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you, sir. Here, we've got some uh, cards for you guys right here at the front. Um, right over here. Pastor, maybe you can grab them. We've got some brochures for you guys, just some information about what to do now, how to begin your walk with God, how to follow Jesus. So 
Um, I'm going to turn the service over to Pastor Bob, but it's let me tell you one thing before you go to your seats. It's so important now to get into a good church that's teaching the Bible, okay? Any church. You don't have to come here. I'd love it if you did because I believe this is a great church. But it's good to get in a church that's teaching the Bible, teaching the Word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Amen? And it's good to get in the Bible and get a Bible and begin reading. Start in the book of John. Amen? Amen. Pastor? Well, praise God. We serve a, an amazing God. I just, um, we do want to make an offer. If anybody needs prayer for anything at all, uh, we're going to have some of our prayer partners uh, make themselves available up front here. Uh, so if you need prayer, the Lord maybe will speak in your heart about something specific, or maybe you need a physical touch. Last night we had several people get prayed over, and they were physically healed right there on the spot. And uh, so God is still uh, actively engaged. And so, I mean, if, if you need to go, I certainly understand that. But uh, if you'd like to come forward for prayer, I would just want to make sure you know that offer is available. Otherwise, again, Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night, we have an awesome prayer service. I would encourage you to connect with um, Amanda. She looks like she's heading back there right now to go to the table for signing up for the newsletter. And um, so let's just join together in prayer. And... Um, Again, at the conclusion of the prayer, if you want to make your way forward or if you want to make your way forward right now, you can. And, and I believe Chris will be up here praying for different people as others. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for speaking to each one of us this morning. Lord, it wasn't happenstance or coincidence that any one of us were here. And so we know that you have a divine plan for each one. And Lord, that your love for each person here is is overwhelming. You're not to be feared in, in the sense of, of being af afraid of you, but we can trust you. So we thank you for this word. We ask that it would just marinate in our minds, Lord, throughout the rest of this day and into this week. And, and Lord, just put a, a greater hunger within each one of us to know you more. And we will give you all the credit and all the praise. Bless each family now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you, church. Have a God-filled day.